Welcome to the Murfreesboro City Council. It's February 15th, 2018. Uh, happy belated Valentine's Day. Um, if you would bow your heads, I have the prayer and the pledge. Father, I thank you for this day, this chance that we get to come together to uh, work on things here in the city of Murfreesboro. Uh, specifically, Lord, we pray tonight uh, for our friends in Florida. Uh, we pray for those that have lost their lives, uh, for coaches, for, for parents who've lost kids. And Lord, we pray for healing. Um, we just ask that you comfort those that are that are in need. At the same time, we pray for our kids that are in our schools, that any fear that they have, uh, Lord, that you would take that away. We pray for our service providers who protect our children every single day, for our teachers who teach our kids and who are also protecting our kids. We pray for safety around them. We pray for your peace and your, your, your glory. I thank you for the things that we're working on in this city. Uh, let us be guided and directed by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Yeah. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. We're missing a couple of council members tonight, so we are still have a quorum of four, right? All right. We have one ceremonial item tonight. I always smile when I see Mr. Tucker out in the, the audience. So, Mr. Tucker, the... Uh, the podium is yours. Speaking as the county historian. That's right. <laughs> you know, it's a, a tradition or practice among organizations, be they public or private, to recognize and memorialize their founders. Murfreesboro is an exception. Uh, I think a couple of months ago, uh, we talked and illustrated how definition can make such a difference in what we regard as our history. So let me offer some information to define what would be a founder of a town or a city. Uh, I'm speaking about four individuals who I consider to be the founders of Murfreesboro. It began back in 1811 when the state legislature appointed town commissioners. They appointed seven individuals and charged them with selecting a site and developing a town. That alone, you would think, would be enough to qualify them as founders of the, of the, the town that resulted, but there's more. Each of them was required to post a bond to ensure their integrity of their performance. Each one of them posted a $4,000 bond. $4,000 in 1812 was a staggering amount of money. So these people are obviously taking seriously the responsibility they've been given. But nevertheless, three of them quit. Uh, they quit because of, I guess, a difference of opinion or perhaps somebody said something and somebody else took it as an insult. But nevertheless, three of them quit. Uh, the remaining four now having to work unanimously in order to have the majority they needed, the quorum, they chose an appropriate site for the new town. They negotiated the purchase of the property from a private citizen. They drew the contract and the deed. They had it signed. They eventually filed it in the appropriate way. They retained a surveyor, one of their own, and had him survey 70 lots around a two-acre center core, which was to be where the courthouse and jail and such would be placed. They conducted an auction sale of those 70 lots to raise funds to build the courthouse. They designed the courthouse. They wrote specifications for the new courthouse and the jail. They advertised in the Nashville newspaper for a builder to come build uh, as they had designed. Uh, they hired a builder. Uh, interesting, the ad that ran in the Nashville newspaper is informative because it has the four names of the individuals we're talking about, clearly in charge of what was being done in developing the city. Uh, the courthouse was built to their specifications. They then used some of the remaining funds to clear and improve the streets and what was to be the downtown area. 
and for the next three years they regulated and governed the city. Uh, I think on those facts we could clearly say these four gentlemen were our founders. You know, since there has been no attempt to memorialize or, or recognize these four, I would expect that only those of us that are closely involved with the city today would even be aware of what their names are or who they were or what they were. So let me ask Mayor McFarlane, among these four, uh, wh which one do you find to be particularly interesting? I, I don't know. I, is this a trick question? <laughs> oh, no, no, I'm not trying to embarrass you, although we probably have. <laughs> yeah, you have. <laughs> All right. Well, you, use your fellow next to you. I know Mr. Shacklett will know one because there's a little bitty sign on the inside circle of the courthouse square that has one of the names on it. Right there in front of your Bill, right I in front of your. I want to use shop. a lifeline, Bill. <laughs> Well, I, I can't get four of them, but I could. I know William Lytle would be one of them. Let me tell you about some of these four. One of them is Hans Hamilton. Heard that name? Hans Hamilton. Uh, he uh, came into about 5,000 acres in uh, Rutherford <laughs> County, not because he was a veteran and not because he was the son of a veteran. He was the grandson of a revolutionary veteran who was a surgeon serving with the North Carolina military in the Revolutionary War. Died conveniently, so Hans got, if you pull up the tax records, Hans never turned a bit of ground. He was a speculator and a, uh, a dealer in properties. In fact, every year he owns different properties in different parts. At one time he, at one time he controlled about 10,000 acres, uh, but he was, he was buying and selling. Uh, he was one of the four. Another one who is on the little sign that nobody knows where it is but me <laughs> was Hugh Robinson. He was a surveyor that was part of the group of four. Yeah. And uh, sometime back, the inner circle of the court square was named the Hugh Robinson Circle uh, with no real explanation. Of course, he may be the one who made the embarrassing error that we talked about last month, most likely. Uh, John Thompson. John Thompson was proud of the fact that he was a colonel in the Tennessee militia. He also was at one time uh, the equivalent of a road superintendent for the first few years of the county. He was one of the petitioners for the formation of the county. He was uh, presided over the first session of the Rutherford County Court. He was a trustee for Bradley Academy. Late in his career, right late in his lifetime, he decided to be a doctor and before long was practicing medicine in, in Murfreesboro. He was a uh, lifetime Baptist until the last few years and then he converted to uh, a new uh, faith that had come on the scene. In fact, I found one reference to him where he said, quote, I glory in the name Camelite. <laughs> the fourth one was Owen Edwards that even I had trouble figuring out who he was. He came into this area in the 1780s, which means he was about 20 to 30 years before anybody else showed up. Uh, being one of the oldest uh, in the community probably counted a lot towards his being appointed for this service. Uh, he was part of the petition that formed Rutherford County, and he owned lots in Jefferson, which means his position assisting the development of Mercer was working against his own financial interest. But John Thompson, the colonel, Owen Edwards, the older early settler, Hugh Robinson, the surveyor, and Hans Hamilton, the land speculator, are the four who actually founded Murfreesboro, doing all the details of that. All right, uh, there's got to be a lesson here somewhere. Why are they not particularly recognized? Or why is there no memorial dating back many, many years to them? Uh, in 1815, they were still sitting on quite a bit of money and were running the town as authoritarian. Uh, they, they had been appointed, never elected. And uh, some concerns arose about what was being done with the money and how the money was being used. 
And finally, a group of citizens petitioned the legislature that said we ought to be able to vote. Our, this is a democracy. We should be able to elect our leaders and ask that they essentially be fired. And the four of them were taken down in 1815. And uh, we had the first democratic elections of aldermen uh, that set up the, the town government. Uh, I guess the lesson is no matter how much good you do for people, the last thing you do is what you're going to be remembered for. <laughs> Thank you. That's awesome. I, I can tell you right now, I never would have been able to guess who the four <coughs> founders of Murfreesboro. That's, that's pretty cool. Well, had any of you ready with the names? No. Maybe we ought to do something somewhere to recognize those four. We'll see you next month. All right. And we're going to have a test on this when you come back. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Tucker. All right, you have several items that are on your consent agenda. If there's no questions or comments about the consent agenda, I move for approval. Second. Motion and second. Ms. Wright, you'll call the roll. Mr. Shacklett? Aye. Mr. Smotherman? Aye. Mr. Wade? Aye. Mayor McFarland? Aye. You have the minutes of the January 11th regular meeting, the January 25th regular meeting, February 8th special meeting, and the February 9th work session. Any additions or deletions to the minutes? So moved. Second. Motion and second. Ms. Wright, we'll call the roll. Mr. Shacklett? Aye. Mr. Smotherman? Aye. Mr. Wade? Aye. Mayor McFarland? Aye. We'll move into second readings. We'll consider for passage on second and final reading or at 17 OZ 63 to rezone an area along Manson Pike and Brinkley Road to Commercial Fringe CF District 2017 442. Move for approval. Second. Motion and second. Ms. Wright? Mr. Shacklett? Aye. Mr. Smotherman? Aye. Mr. Wade? Aye. Mayor McFarland? Aye. Consider for passages on second and final reading ordinance 17 OZ 64, rezoning an area along Burnt Knob and Veterans Parkway to Highway Commercial CH District 2017 446. Move for approval. Second. Motion and second. Ms. Wright, we'll call the roll. Mr. Shacklett? Aye. Mr. Smotherman? Aye. Mr. Wade? Aye. Mayor McFarland? Aye. Consider for passage on second and final reading ordinance 18001, amending the 2017 2018 budget, the Second Amendment. So moved. Second. Motion and second. Ms. Wright? Mr. Shacklett? Aye. Mr. Smotherman? Aye. Mr. Wade? Aye. Mayor McFarland? Aye. Move to new business. Um, it's always good every year that we get to hear from Joe Hastings and Associates with regard to our comprehensive annual financial report for fiscal year June 30th, 2017. Mr. Mayor, members of council, uh, Mr. Tucker's story was a good segue into our audit report here. But I'm glad to say that we have a clean opinion, so there's no questions about the, the money in this case. So. <laughs> we do have a clean opinion, and uh, you've got your audit report there. Um, if you'll look under the tab, it says Independent Auditor's Report, which is actually page one. As I said, that's a clean or uh, unmodified opinion. It goes through two pages of language to tell you that, but the, the good news is that that's, that is a clean opinion. Um, the, the next section there is the management's discussion and analysis. That starts on page three. That is uh, uh, presented by management and, and goes into a, a, uh, a narrative of the year that the city's had uh, financially. Gives a lot of information and a few pages about the city's operations financially and, and the budget and uh, financial highlights that, that are important. So if a, a citizen or someone interested uh, wants to get a quick overview of the last year, last fiscal year, that's a good place to start. And it's uh, just a few pages there. We've talked about uh, before, but uh, it's good to have just a, an overview of what the financial statements of a city government uh, look like. There's actually two presentations for a city, city government. Uh, the traditional approach is on the budget approach, 
And that, that focuses on one year of budget expenditures and revenues. And the balance sheet only includes items that, uh, like cash, that we have available to spend on the budget. It, it includes uh, receivables that will soon be cash, but it doesn't include long-term assets of the city or long-term debt like uh, infrastructure or, or bonds. And like I say, that's the traditional approach and just focusing on the budget. Well, sometime several years ago, uh, it was decided that, the, that another approach was necessary to, to focus on the long-term uh, financial position of the city. And if you go to page 23, the long-term approach includes all the debt of the city. It includes all the assets, which would, which would include hard assets like this building and infrastructure, roads. Uh, it includes all the assets of the city. It includes underground assets of the, of the utilities and, and just everything that, that uh, more like a business would present. So on page 23 is the statement of net position. And as I said, this is the government-wide approach, so it includes everything. And you'll see uh, under the governmental activities, which is the governmental funds and, and uh, uh, those type of activities, you'll see their total assets of just over a billion dollars at June 30th of 17. And going on down, you'll, you'll see all the liabilities. Again, this includes all the liabilities, including long-term debt, bonds, uh, uh, loans, all the debt. And you'll see a total there in the governmental activities, $385 million for, for at the end of June. Going on down to the bottom where you see the net position category there, uh, that is the total of assets minus the total liabilities of the city. And you'll see uh, for the governmental activities, there was just over $581 million in net position. Uh, for business type activities, which is the utilities uh, mainly, that's uh, a net position of $571 million at the end of the year. So the combined uh, all assets and minus the liabilities at the end of the year was $1.1 billion. You'll see that down in the lower right hand corner. That's the balance sheet. And on the next page, <clears throat> under the same approach, uh, we're looking at the programs of the city, and this is the revenues and expenses on, on page 24. And you'll see, for instance, in, in uh, police. For the year ended June 30th of 17, uh, the police expenditures, total expenditures, were just over $29 million. And as you go out to the right, it tells what sources of funds were available to, to finance those. Uh, in the police department, as you imagine, there's not uh, a huge amount of uh, uh, charges. There's, there's uh, tickets and, and that sort of thing that are collected in that department, but uh, not a lot of source. Most of police activities, of course, are covered by, by taxes. <coughs> each, each department has that sort of presentation there. <clears throat> Again, this, this includes things like depreciation on this approach. It's uh, depreciation of assets. It's, it's not the traditional budget approach, but it includes all expenses that related to that. But that's the, the, the presentation on this approach. Uh, down about halfway down the page, you'll see business type activities, water, sewer. Uh, they had a total expenditures of $38.8 million. And uh, there, those services, of course, are provided for by fees to the customer. So you'll see to the right there, there was $46.7 million in, in fees. So. As you go across, you'll see that it actually had a, a positive number, uh, net number there. Down below are the general revenues that cover all the programs of the city, like the, the property taxes, sales taxes, other types of taxes. And as you go down, you can see those. I'm just hitting the highlights here. I don't want to keep you too long. but. 
Flipping on over to uh, page 25. This is the traditional approach of the government. And you'll see the different funds there. You start with the general fund, you've got the, uh, the school fund, debt service fund, and then so on. All the other governmental funds are combined into one column that are, that are not as uh, significant funds. But under the general fund column, Look down there. Again, this only includes short-term assets that are going to be available to spend in the next budget, basically. So we've got cash and in investments, but the total uh, assets at the end of the year in the general fund was $122 million. Uh, you'll see liabilities down below that of $14 million. <clears throat> Now down at the bottom, uh, an important category is fund balance. Down at the bottom of the general fund column, you'll see that the unassigned uh, fund balance is $54.4 million. <laughs> now what that means is that uh, that that is the amount available uh, to be used by the council or by the city uh, uh, it, it's what's not been reserved or assigned for any particular purpose, and it's just uh, the fund balance of the city. So that's that's a good number, and it's a it's a sizable number that that amounts to over 50 percent of the annual expenditures. So what it says is there's a, there's quite a cushion there uh, in the event that that something doesn't go as planned. So you'll see the other funds there, and uh, under the total governmental funds, you'll see in that fund balance at the bottom, bottom right, 103 million, 103.7 million is the is the combined fund balances. Now, as we flip over to page 27. Uh, you'll see that these, these are the, uh, the governmental funds. Again, the general fund is presented there along with the school funds and, and the other funds. Again, this is on the budget basis, so, so this shows the revenues and expenditures for, for the year. And you'll see general fund had total revenues, $135.3 million, and had total You'll see the expenditures by, by uh, function there, $103.9 million for the same period. And each of those are presented by fund there. As we go back further, uh, on page 29 is a more detailed approach to the general fund. It also includes the budget comparison that goes for several pages it's very very detailed in fact as you go further back in this report it's uh, and uh, for people who can't see it it's a 200 page report so there's a lot of information in here but uh, as you go back further you get more and more detail about each of those funds and and uh, of course I won't won't go through all that but starting on page 47 is the notes to the financial statements. There's a lot of information in here about the city's accounting policies. There's information about the city's debt and, and uh, assets. Gives a lot of uh, detail concerning those. On page uh, 65 is where uh, the information about long-term debt is, and you can see the different bond issues, how the debt changed during the year, what was added to debt, what was, what was paid.
And then skipping way back to, uh, uh, there's a section called the statistical section. It is, starts on page 153. This includes a lot of data on the last 10 years of the city, and it's a good indicator of the growth we've experienced in the city. You can see things like expenditures, how they've changed each year for 10 years, uh, uh, the revenues. Um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. A lot of presentations with 10-year with uh, figures. For instance, on one, page 157, On that page, we show the property taxes and the sales taxes for the last 10 years. And for instance, if you look at the sales tax column, in 2008, there was just over $30.3 million collected in, in sales tax. In 2017, the year ended June of 2017, that number was $43.6 million. So you can see the growth there in the retail uh, business in the in the city, and uh, also an indicator of just general growth that we've had. Page one sixty five. Get some information on the outstanding debt, and it indicates uh, things like uh, the per capita amount of debt. It actually went down this year. To go up again. And flipping on back to page 180, uh, the city receives, as you all know, uh, uh, federal grant money for certain projects and situations. This shows the amount of federal grant money that was received by the city during the year and uh, the program that was involved with that federal money. There's a similar schedule starting on 182 for state, state funds that were received, state grant funds. There is a, on page 189, there's a summary of our auditor's results. It just gives an overview of, of things like the, the opinion was uh, unmodified and, and uh, a summary of our, of our audit there. And that's hitting the high spots. Once again, we'd like to commend Melissa and Aaron uh, for their cooperation. They're a great help, and they do a great job. And uh, anytime we do an audit of this size, we, we, we hit a lot of departments because we're looking at a lot of transactions in the city. And so we come in contact with a lot of city employees, and, and we're, we're happy to say we got cooperation wherever we were. So, so we appreciate that. and uh, and. Uh, we commend the city for great, great staff. I'll be happy to answer any questions. The, the report, I think, is already available on the website. And uh, so anyone wanting to, to see it can find it there on the city's website. Thank you for all the hard work. Um, I don't want to go straight to material findings, but whenever we're looking at our our audit and there's, when we see that we've got repeat finding, do you feel comfortable that we're getting some of those? I mean, it looks like there's minor issues, but are we getting the, the measures in place to make sure that those repeat findings don't occur? That's F probably something staff should answer as opposed to sure. the person who's supposed to find them. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, we, we have dealt with uh, some of these findings with the departments where they occurred and talked to them about the importance of making sure that finance is aware. One in particular, uh, 
this year was an unrecorded payable that a staff member had held the bill because he wasn't ready for the bill to be paid, which was fine. We just didn't know a bill had been received. If we had known, we could have booked the liability. And so that's, that's why that finding in particular came up. And we, we try very hard to tell all the departments that you're in, even if you're not ready to pay the bill, make sure we're aware there is a bill. So um, I, I think that was uh, communicated pretty well with that department. And we, we also will watch that more closely to make sure uh, that isn't missed again. For uh, water and sewer, they had actually a different kind of finding this year, but it was similar to the year before. And it was just a, a, another, another issue that arose after last year's audit was done that's, I believe, already been, been dealt with, and, and um, it was just an oversight. Um, then we also have our cemetery, which has several repeat findings, and uh, last year, I think MTAS came in and tried to do some training with cemetery staff about separation of duties and the and, uh, importance of how things should be booked. That is probably something we may want to continue a discussion with council going forward to see how we want to address those going forward. Mayor, I will say that uh, that an organization of this size with as many transactions as we have, uh, there's, there's typically going to be some, some sort of sure. recommendation or finding. But I will say here that they take these extremely seriously and uh, work to get them uh, resolved immediately. So we, and, and we're always willing to help if there's anything we're needed in doing. We have worked with the water and sewer to, to resolve this finding. We've been working with them on that. So um, uh, it, it's something that's taken very, very seriously, and, and, and that's, that's something we're, we look at as well. Any questions? I love seeing the chart that shows 2015 was really the first year that our property tax and our sales tax were equal. And then every, it, it flipped to where in 16, proper, our sales tax was greater than property tax. 17, it's sales tax is greater than property tax. So that, that's a good trend to, mm -hmm. to see. I think this year it was 39% sales tax 36 percent property tax so last year it was it was less than that as far as a percentage so it was uh that's, that's a good percentage to see all right any questions i think we need to take a motion to accept um accept our audit so move second motion is second mr to call the roll <laughs> Mr. Shacklett? Aye. Mr. Smotherman? Aye. Mr. Wade? Aye. Mayor McFarland? Aye. Mr. Joe, thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. Do you have some staff you want to uh, recognize yes, who I know I helps with the budget or helps with this every year? Yeah, they, they not only help, but they, they do a lot more than I do. But uh, <laughs> Suzanne Vandiver and Molly Patricus are, have been with me a long time. I won't say how long, but uh, they. N not uh, longer than they look so <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're very appreciative of their hard work and i i think uh, I, I feel like melissa is as well so. yeah well it's good to have the the extra set of eyes that look over everything especially to let the public know that we're managing everything the way it's supposed to be managed so thank you for your hard work and uh, what you do not just to help us during the budget time but what you do to help us during the course of the year because i know Anytime that there's a question, anything that we need help with, y'all are always there for us. That's true. Thank you. We appreciate it. Thank you. All right, we'll now move into consider, uh, considerations of the Water Resources Board. Mayor Council, thank you uh, for the opportunity this evening to come and present this. This is a uh, veterinary cl uh, clinic off of uh, 4520 Veterans Parkway. This is a uh, dealing with our system development charges or our capacity fees and a special assessment. Um, this does not fall within our defined categories within city code. So we're fortunate that this is the exact same building layout, equipment, owner, 
uh, that owns the uh, clinic off of Stones River, uh, the Stones River Vet Clinic off 3164 Memorial Boulevard. So we went back and looked at 12 months usage, water consumption for that facility and assumed that this f f facility would use that same amount of water. It equals uh, 6.4 single family units. When you apply our system capacity fee and our uh, special assessment district, the overall creek special sanitary sewer assessment district, that's $16,320 and $6,400 respectively. And that's a total of 22,720. So in instances like these, we, we bring it before the council since it doesn't fit our regular pattern or our regular formula, and we would request your approval to charge those uh, capacity fees and assessment district or assessment fee. Move for approval. Second. Motion and second. <clears throat> Mr. Shacklett? Aye. Mr. Smotherman? Aye. Mr. Wade? Aye. Mayor McFarland? Abstain. Thank you. Thank you. We'll, we'll now consider recommendations of the Planning Commission to schedule public hearings. Uh, we have, Mr. Bomby, I'll read them off for you. We have a planned residential development zoning amendment for approximately 28.1 acres in Kimbrough Woods, located along Veterans Parkway and St. Andrews Drive. Kimbrough Development Group is the applicant. Zoning for approximately 5.9 acres along City View Drive to be rezoned from single family residential 10 RS 10 district to, co to college and university CU district. MTSU campus planning is the applicant. Zoning ordinance amendments to section 13 plan development regulations, section 19 residential district, section 21 commercial districts, chart one and chart one end notes, uses permitted by zoning district pertaining to multifamily housing. City of Murfreesboro planning department is the applicant. Mr. Bomley. Thank you, Mayor McFarland, and good evening, Mayor McFarland, the members of council. Uh, these three public hearings were handled by the Planning Commission in approximately 23 minutes last uh, last Wednesday night. So I think we can um, these three can easily be accommodated in one meeting, and we would uh, recommend, if uh, if it works for council, a March 22nd uh, City Council public hearing date for all three of these items. Okay, March 22nd. Anyone? So moved. Second. Motion and a second. Ms. Wright? Mr. Shacklett? Aye. Mr. Smotherman? Aye. Mr. Wade? Aye. Mayor McFarland? Aye. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Palmer. All right, we'll consider recommendations of the city engineer uh, for an approval of master services agreement with Energy Land and Infrastructure, uh, ELI, for professional services. Good evening, Mayor and members of the council. You're not the city engineer. <laughs> no. He is, he is out this evening. I'm his proxy. Um, the city of Murfreesboro currently has several master service contracts with professional consultants providing a variety of services. ELI has recently provided engineering services for the city of Murfreesboro both as a prime and sub consultant. Services that ELI provide include environmental studies, permitting surveys, structural design, road design, plans review, and construction engineering. The master service agreement would allow the city staff to use ELI periodically in development and implementation of smaller or specialized type projects. Staff has advertised since June 2017 to hire a full-time project engineer to join engineering department, but have not reached an agreement with any candidate. Therefore, to assist with the current workload, we request the approval of task order number one which allows ELI, ELI to provide an on-call consultant service for a project engineer to assist with daily activities of the engineering department. The project engineer will assist with items such as project development, plans review, construction management. Funding will be available based on the implementation plan. Task orders under 25,000 will be submit, submitted to the city manager for review and approval. Task orders over 25,000 will be presented to council for consideration. Uh, staff estimates task order number one to be 3,000 per week based on assistance from a project engineer for approximately 25 hours per week. We anticipate continuing this service under this task order until a full-time project engineer is hired, which is expected to occur, to occur the first quarter of the new budget year. Staff recommends funding these services from the salary line item in the current budget. If approved, a budget amendment will follow to request moving the funds from salary line item to professional services. Uh, it is staff's recommendation uh, to approve the master service agreement with the ELI as well as 
task order number one. I'm available to answer any questions you may have. Any questions for Mr. Kerr? Mr. Kerr, I think this is also an item that we talked about in our workshop on Friday, wasn't it? That's correct. <coughs> so is this a year long contract? Uh, this month this month? particular contract gets us through the end of the year with, it gets us through the end of this budget year with a, with a ex monthly extension until we can hire a full-time engineer okay. on staff. So moved. Second. Motion and a second. Ms. Wright, you'll call the roll. Mr. Shacklett. Aye. Mr. Smotherman. Aye. Mr. Wade. Aye. Mayor McFarland. Aye. You have a letter from the City Recorder Finance Director uh, regarding initial resolution 18R03 and a detailed written. Uh, we skipped number 10. I'm sorry. They're very similar. It's all the same, same thing. I, I checked marked over it. Sorry. Consider recommendations of the tra Transportation Director regarding task order number five with Neil Schaefer Inc. for a traffic engineer in training EIT part-time equivalent. Sorry about that. That's okay. I could say ditto to the previous and move. Uh, or or move engineer, still, the traffic engineer. A lot of y'all weren't here, but Mr. Uh, Ken Honeycutt, who was the assistant or was the fire marshal, came up one time and I read what the comment was and he looked at everyone and said, any questions? <laughs> <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> Uh, staff has advertised since July 2017 to hire a full-time traffic engineer to join our department, uh, and we haven't reached an agreement with any candidate. The city transportation department recently requested an RFP from two local firms to provide these services. Neil Schaefer was ultimately selected by staff. In order to assist the current workload, we request the approval of task order number five, which allows Neil Schaefer to provide on-call consultant services for, trans for a traffic engineer. Staff estimates the task order will be approximately $9,900 per month uh, based on the assistance of a, of, from a traffic engineer for 24 hours per week. We anticipate continuing this service until the ta uh, this, the services under this task order until a full-time en traffic engineer is hired, uh, which is expected to occur the first quarter of the new budget. Uh, staff recommends funding the services from the salary line item in the current budget. If approved, a budget amendment will follow to request moving the funds from salary line item to professional services. Um, staff recommends approval of task order number three with Neil Schaefer. I have, I'm available for any questions you may have. Jim, could you please repeat the number for the monthly expense? Uh, $9,903.75 per month. Again, this is till the remainder of the year until we can get somebody in place. Yes, sir. Our time. Move for approval. Second. Motion and second. Mr. Wright, we'll call the roll. Mr. Shacklett. Aye. Mr. Smotherman. Aye. Mr. Wade. Aye. Mayor McFarland. Aye. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. All right, now you have a letter from the city recorder finance director regarding initial resolution 18R03 and a detailed resolution number 18R04. Mayor, um, we've talked about the CIP off and on over several workshops over the last few months, and we now have a $70 million uh, listing in place. We need to do the initial resolution as well as the detailed resolutions to allow us to move forward with the borrowing. They, uh, the, the resolution is up to $71 million because we do have to be prepared for issuance costs and things that are not part of our regular listing of projects. Um, the uh, resolutions were prepared by our bond council with our input, uh, Raspberry and Sims, also Cumberland Securities of whom John Warner is here tonight also went through those and offered suggestions for making sure these are as accurate as they need to be. I'm sure he'd be glad to help answer any questions you may have, as would I or Mr. Crumley. Any questions? So moved. We have two resolutions. Yes, yeah, so we have, um, 
excuse me, adoption, we'll need to consider for adoption initial resolution <coughs> number 18R03, authorizing to issuance the general obligation bonds by the city of Murfreesboro, Tennessee, of not to exceed $71 million to provide funding for certain pr public works projects and to fund the incidental and necessary expenses related thereto. You're so moved on B. So moved on everything. Okay, we have a motion. <laughs> Motion and, a, and a, a second. And a second. That's right. Mr. Shacklett? Aye. Mr. Smotherman? Aye. Mr. Wade? Aye. Mayor McFarland? I will now consider for adoption detailed resolution number 18R04, authorizing the issuance of general obligation bonds of the City of Murfreesboro, Tennessee, in the aggregate principal amount not to exceed $71 million in one or more series, making provision of the issuance, sale, and payment of said bonds, establishing the terms thereof and the disposition of proceeds therefrom, and providing for the levy of taxes for the payment of principal of premium, if any, in interest on the bonds. So moved. Second. Motion to second, Ms. Wright. Mr. Shacklett? Aye. Mr. Smotherman? Aye. Mr. Wade? Aye. Mayor McFarland? Aye. All right, we'll now consider recommendations of the interim city manager. Mayor and Council, uh, I know you all have been hearing what I'm hearing in the community about our construction projects. Uh, tonight we have a package of items for your consideration, which we think will help clarify and allow us to build better processes for the future on our vertical construction. Uh, start with police headquarters. Uh, the project, I think, got a, a very uh, bad press release uh, with a huge number over budget, uh, which is just not accurate, just not the case. Uh, I heard a, a great number of comments Sunday when I was around town, and I'm sure you all have been assailed by similar comments. Um, the, the project is nowhere close to being $23 million over budget. Uh, that was a, a headline to garner just exactly what it did, comment around the community. Uh, in reality, I think what you're going to find is the project is somewhere in the neighborhood of 2 to $2.5 million over budget. But because of those questions, and because of the sheer size of the construction project at police headquarters, uh, we want your approval to go forward with what would be a post-construction management review and audit of the building. Uh, this is very typical, we think, in very large construction projects. Police headquarters is by far the largest construction project that Murfreesboro has entered into to date. In addition, uh, uh, we would ask for several other services along with police headquarters. We're recommending the firm of CBRE Heary to do that post-construction management review on the project, along with some other important things such as helping our staff go through, uh, look at the building as it comes closer to substantial completion, prepare, preparing final punch lists along with our staff, uh, the things that we don't have enough expertise to be completely able to do ourselves. Uh, the price for this has been quoted as hourly rates with a not to exceed number of $27,000. We're asking your approval tonight. The funding for this is in the contingency of the police headquarters project. Um, I've got to give credit to City Attorney Craig Tindall. He has done 100% of the work in getting this ready for your all's consideration. Uh, we'll be glad to try to field any questions you have about this post-construction review or audit. Uh, we also have a representative from CBRE here in the audience with us tonight. Council members, this is something that we have discussed over the last many, many weeks, but it's specifically as we've talked about in our last council meetings on looking at how we handle construction projects moving forward. Um, so I, you know, I, I think the, the police headquarters is something we can all be proud of. The process, I, I definitely think we own when things are done right and we own when things are can have improvement. And I think we, this is a step in seeing where uh, and how we improve our construction process. So I think it's something that is absolutely warranted. And, um, you know, the, the council, as, as you all know, we're not involved in day-to-day -day decisions on what and how the, the money is spent once we approve those individual items. And I think it's prudent not only for
for our staff, but it's prudent for the, the taxpayer that we make sure that we're, we're auditing that those things, not only in the beginning, uh, which I think is what we're gonna do moving forward, but monitoring during the process and then checking that again as the process is over with. And if there's any things that, that this group finds that we need to improve on them as a council, we'll rectify those uh, moving forward. Mayor, if I could, I'd just add that um, there's a couple other services I think that have been identified as, as we start to go through the process. A couple of them are outlined here. The numbers here are very preliminary. Uh, here he's only been on the job for about a week, so uh, we're still working through some of these. So uh, I don't want anybody to get set on the, the numbers that are expressed in the information you have because it's still very, very much an estimate. Craig is exactly right. Uh, those other services we're still in discussion with here he are commissioning of the major systems in the building, uh, giving our staff the uh, opportunity to see the systems uh, begin their startup, make sure we have proper training on operating the major systems of the building, uh, serve as a moving manager as after the building is accepted, as police department begins its physical move from existing locations to the new building. Uh, to have someone in charge of that and organize and make that efficient and effective. Uh, last, it's the decommissioning of the existing police headquarters. Um, the building can't be left just as it is. And so taking down those major building systems, thoroughly cleaning the building uh, to put it in shape uh, after it's no longer in service as the police headquarters. Again, as Craig has pointed out, those fees are still being negotiated at this point in time. So is this gonna be a monthly contract? So is this gonna be a monthly contract? They've quoted us hourly rates with not to exceed, and I think those three services that we're still working with here on would also be hourly rates not to exceed. Okay. Um, we, we feel that works well in this situation. Uh, each project's different, and it'd be very difficult, I think, for them to to quote a precise number, uh, we prefer having a maximum cap on our contracts like this. So I think it will be an hourly rate not to exceed. Okay. I think we're headed in the right direction with the owner's rep. So I'm trying to get my head around what are we approving because is this a long-term relationship or what what are we what are we approving well, right now it's just a, it's an agreement to um, to handle this project to close out this project uh, to, to yes, for the construction side and then the police building just the police building at this police point in time okay. right okay and and close out the old building too is that part of decommission the, the old police headquarters. right yeah. to help us close down that building I don't like the word mothball, but mothballing of the old police headquarters. So if it gets to that point to where, was it 29,000, is that what it was? 27. 27,000. Will you be back to approve beyond that if something? Uh, well, right now it's not anticipated. There'll be other services that will be required and there may be other contractors that are required. And so depending on the amounts that those come in, we may bring it back to council. All of this is anticipated at this point in time, and, and it's still preliminary, but uh, there will be contingency fees or contingency funds left in the um, construction budget that can handle these amounts. So, um, you know, technically they've already been approved and we're just allocating them to, to different services that still remain. As we committed to you all earlier, we don't want to spend money out of that contingency without your knowledge of it. Uh, we think we have your approval of it already in terms of the, the, the formal recognition of that contingency budget and your approval by it as a, a one large lump sum and the GMP for the building. Uh, but our commitment was we would bring back those items that we're spending out of the contingency for your review. to approve that. Mm -hmm. It's already approved, isn't it? No. No. It's really almost like the audit. We're looking for your approval and concurrence and I the actions that we've already started. I think it's beneficial. It's, it's good to get a motion on it, even even yeah. if it's under the contingency. Um, you know, I think it's something that is good, even large numbers under a, a master contingency budget in a, in a project like this 
regardless if we have a, a, a contingency budget that's there, I think this council needs to know when money is being allocated or spent out of those contingency items. Because um, I think uh, it's safe to say as council members, we may have a contingency body budget there, but that contingency budget to us is a worst case scenario using that budget. And you know, there's gonna be things in construction that comes up, especially on a building that we're technically renovating slash demolishing almost. But, you know, if there's large numbers of, of contingency items, we need to know about that. So moved. Second. Motion and second, Mr. Wright. Mr. Shacklett. Aye. Mr. Smotherman. Aye. Mr. Wade. Aye. Mayor McFarland. Aye. We first learned of, of CBRE Heary and, and their predecessor firm, which was Pinnacle Building Group, uh, when the city went out to take requests for qualifications on owner's representatives. Um, if you remember, police headquarters was really our first experience with the construction manager at risk. Doug Young Training Center was the second of those experiences. And we, what we've found is that the cost savings that I think all of us had hoped for haven't been so readily apparent in using that construction manager at risk process. So we went out and began our search for owner's representative. We found two firms that interested us greatly, CBR Heary being one, Savalas being the other. Uh, we've talked to Savalas about taking over as owner's representative on the Doug Young Public Safety Training Center. Uh, the construction manager at risk has withdrawn from that project. So we are currently, once the, the current process is completed, the GMP that is underway, being the training tower uh, is, is underway and completed, we no longer will have that construction manager at risk on that site. We will need some help in determining whether we prepare bid specs and go out to bid with the project using engineers, using an architect, using the owner's representative. So in discussions with Savalas, we've asked them to come in and do a number of things at the training center to kind of list those for you. Uh, number one, to review the current state and progress that has been made at the training center. Number two, deliver an opinion as to whether uh, the project as it is being prepared now meets both the city's needs for a training facility and can meet the city's budget that you all have set for the Doug Young training facility. They would prepare uh, and, and give us recommendations onto the design process, and if necessary, they provide us suggestions on how to pull the project back into the budget that you've allocated for it. Uh, they too have proposed an hourly rate contract with a not to exceed number of $25,000. If we choose to use them to actually bid components of the project going forward, there would be a separate contract with additional fees. But in this particular contract, they come in, they review and establish where we are with the project, a process for going forward with their recommendations, and if necessary, how we trim the budget to meet, how we trim the project to meet the budget you've established. We heard loud and clear that this was one of the projects that we want to bring in on the numbers in terms of the budget that you've established. So is there a, a written document Report or there, what are we there is, and they did not get attached to the electronic file. I, I was doing this from home, and there are two contracts with Savalas, one for the training center, one for the airport. They're nearly identical. But I apologize that they did not get attached to the electronic file. I guess uh, what I was saying, are they going to provide us with a written document as a part of their services? What, what, how are we going to receive this information. They will present us with their recommendations on where the project stands today, how's the best path to go forward, okay. and how do we keep the, the project inside the budget that the council has allotted for. Okay. Mr. Tindler, you've been working on this quite a bit as well. Do you have any, is, is everything look consistent with what you've seen at other municipalities? Well, uh, I haven't done too much on the on the training center as as of yet, but um, yeah, I mean both these both you have to realize both these projects are 
unique and they have some components to it because they're both rehabilitation projects really that make it pretty difficult for no matter what delivery method you use to, to develop out there. And we're in very trying times with respect to budgets because everybody's very busy and construction costs and material costs have gone way up. Um, so in, if, if the question is, are, is this type of services consistent? Absolutely. Um, it's, you know, having an owner's rep that we can turn to uh, and rely on as we go forward in construction is, is very important, regardless of the de delivery method we use, particularly in this type of construction environment. So I think these, the, the plan to use Savalas, is, as I understand it, I've heard tonight, sounds like it's something that we very much need on this project, which is, uh, has a lot of open-ended things that need to be addressed. So, Mr. Crumley, can Savalas handle both contracts at the same time? I know they're new to to the city, but we want to make sure that they can handle both contracts at the same time. And there's a little bit of time lag between the training center and the airport. Uh, training center is right now, as in uh, we're ready with site plans to go to work. Uh, airport probably gets to bid within the next 30 days, so Savalas will enter that at a different point where they get a chance to see the plans, do a little en value engineering of the plans before they go to bid. Uh, but then actually at the airport, they would perform, perform more of what you would think of as true owner's rep overseeing the construction side of the project. I think for the public out there, just to make sure that I'm understanding, what we're really looking at is opposed to using a funding mechanism, which is what we've done in the past to, to put a placeholder and say, we're going to anticipate that we're going to borrow X number of dollars for a project that we don't know what that cost is at the time. We're just anticipating this is what it is. These owner's reps would come in, look at the projects, look at plans from the architect, look at consistent numbers that's in the market, but then also help manage that process as it goes through a low bid process uh, and with the, the, with the uh, contractor. Is that, that correct? One of the things that particularly interested us in Savalas was they do have some expertise in joining in the process early and helping in the design of the entire capital improvement plan. That is not what either of these two contracts is about. These two are project driven, one on the Doug Young Training Center, one on the airport terminal building. Uh, but we do think in future discussions, we would like to involve Savalas into the capital planning process to see if they can bring us some assistance in this continuing uh, time creep and pricing creep that seems to keep catching us in the CIP. What's the time frame as far as their ability to provide all this information to us? Uh, on the Doug Young Training Center, I think we're talking about somewhere around one month. Uh, on the airfield, it'd be a little bit longer than that. Are we still proceeding with the tower? Is that? The uh, training tower at the Doug Young Center uh, is underway and will be completed under the existing guaranteed maximum price that we have with the construction manager. They will fulfill that contract before they uh, officially leave the, the training center site. Is there any cost related to the withdrawal of that construction manager at risk? Relationship? I'm, I'm sorry? The, the yeah. construction manager at risk relationship, is there any cost related to that? There, there are none. We have uh, kept up to par with the development of that and there should not be any one-time cost with them re removing themselves from the process. Both of these will be reviewed in terms of the architect and how we go forward with the architect on these projects too. There'll be recommendations from Savalas. Yeah, I don't want to obviously continue to belabor, but you know, I think if we look at some of the issues that I don't that we were dealing with with Fire Station Four, and we went through a different process, and that saved over a million dollars, estimated a million dollars. And as we're looking at the police headquarters, we're looking at the fire training facility. Um, we've got station four that's going on. I, you know, I, I think 
what we're doing presently can absolutely be improved and i think this is a step in the right direction to be able to do that now at the same time we've got two groups that we're going to be working with now that we've not worked with in the past i think staff has got full full um, faith in both groups and I, it, it honestly i think the good thing is having two groups working we're going to find which group is is doing the best and that gives a little competition to be able to to um look at future projects you know i think with with Harry or whether it's savalas that we're, we're going to see who's who's uh being the most beneficial to the city and i hope both of them are but this gives us another level of accountability i think that we need on our construction projects the team that did the evaluation of the owner's reps proposals of which there were five uh, felt very comfortable with both cbre Heary, and savalas their strengths are different. Uh, Heary's strengths are superb in terms of the actual looking at construction projects going in. Savalas's early planning, helping with CIP, we thought was advantageous. Uh, the mayor didn't use the word competition, but we'd like to have a little friendly competition at this point in time between those two firms to see how they perform. All right. And just, just also recall that the costs involved in in these firms some of these some of those costs are made up by removing the the job from the architect that you pay the architect to do and and shifting them over so some of that uh, takes uh, some of that cost is covered on that the other thing to consider is that you you take the responsibility away from a department head who really doesn't know about construct a lot a lot about construction who yeah. spends an enormous amount of time trying to figure out and manage these construction projects and give it to someone who can do it much more efficiently with a lot more knowledge. And, uh, and that cost savings alone is tremendous. Well, not just cost savings, it's freeing up our department heads to be able to manage the day-to-day -day operations of the city and the needs of the residents and the services we provide and not dealing with construction projects. And you know, so I think even though we're spending some money we're actually saving some money because we're letting them do what they're trained and what they need to be doing as opposed to, to managing projects that, um, you know, that, that we need to hire people who that's their expertise. So at the training center, in addition to the construction manager at risk, having withdrawn from the project's future, we've told the architect to stop where they are until after Savalas can come in, examine where we are, determine the best way to go forward and then we'll proceed as necessary with both the architect, the civil engineer who's done the site plans and anyone else that we need on that construction project. As we're talking about the architect, my blood pressure is starting to rise. So does someone have a motion? So move. <laughs> second. Motion and a second. Ms. Wright. Mr. Shacklett. Aye. Mr. Smotherman. Aye. Mr. Wade. Aye. Mayor Aye. McFarland. Aye. Now, is this on both contracts? What, what did we just approve? This was for the Savalas contract for the training facility uh, and for the Airport. police headquarters. Both. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Excuse me, not police headquarters, but the airport terminal. For the record, it would be for training facility and the airport terminal. The next item we had for, for your consideration was the restart of the Public Building Authority. Um, Public Building Authority under Tennessee statute in a lot of ways is a super city. It has some authorities that we as a city government do not have. One of those is the ability to do true design build construction projects. Uh, we think there's some value in looking at design build for the actual training building at, at the Doug Young Training Center. Uh, the building is a classroom with, uh, in, in a lot of respects and does not require a tremendous amount of complexity in its structure. Uh, so we think it is a candidate potentially for a design build solution. So rekindling, restarting the PBA just puts that option back into our toolbox if we decide design build with the with Savalas reviewing the way forward, if they decide the design build is an option, this enables us to look at design build as an option for the construction over there. Eight of the nine members are still here in the community. Uh, we have not touched base with those folks yet to determine if they're still interested in service. 
uh, we wanted to hear from council in terms of your all's consideration and opinion about whether the PBA adds value as another tool that we could use. I think it makes a lot of sense to me to, to uh, reconstitute it. I, uh, you know, this is another layer of competency and people who are uh, experienced in the uh, construction field that add and look at it from the city's perspective that have the wisdom and the experience to be able to uh, add that to the projects that we we have on the rise and so I think it's a, I think it's a good move I mean, basically they would be appointed by the council as well yeah, they are council representatives um, if you followed the construction of the judicial center as done by the county's public building authority uh, s exactly the same authorities under the state statute except this one would be the city of Murfreesboro's PBA rather than the county's. We have continued to pay the fees with the Secretary of State's office. The PBA is still alive as a corporation, uh, but they have not met in approximately 10 years. All volunteer positions. All volunteers. There you go. I think, in my opinion, any tool that we have in our toolbox right now, we should look at to see um, where we are it is the only way I know of to get to design build yep. and I you know I, w we need to uh, I looked at the list earlier today there may be some additions or deletions that we need to, to look at um, you know that because it is it's it's like the Board of Equalization that we're dealing with right now with the registers office or excuse me the the assessor's office and it takes so much time that you know we're we're going to be looking for people to serve on that board uh, and we need to look at that that list so I, I think it's in my opinion I think it's something we continue to keep active and really I know Mr. Tindall you've got experience with dealing with the PBA that we I don't think we dealt with the PBA and we have not met since I've been here yeah. more than nine years I, well I don't think we've never did anything I don't yeah think we've not I, I don't think we've ever used I mean, the PBA in a project that. within the city right we never did a project that I'm aware of maybe the first time for, for everything do we need a motion for this or do you I, I think a motion would be good uh, with your all's approval we'll start to contact these folks and see if they're still interested or willing Let's, to serve before we um, are the have we we technically they're not they still Depending on their terms their terms yeah. may have expired so it okay. would be a good time to review the well, list yeah let me yeah there's, there's can you get us the names i've got them okay uh, yeah, they're on our our list four. yeah okay. one one member is up for reappointment and there's one vacancy yeah um and we can we contact them every year because they need to waive their meeting if they're not going to meet sure. for corporation purposes and we've just done that so um they i think they got a letter that went out this week or they're about to get a letter that went out this week yeah. so um it's a good time to contact them because we yeah, absolutely reminded them they're around. Okay. So move. Second. Motion is second. Mr. Wright, call the roll. Mr. Shacklett. Aye. Mr. Smotherman. Aye. Mr. Wade. Aye. Mayor McFarland. Aye. Uh, the, the last point under the construction memo uh, is really just to say that we heard you all ask for more information on an ongoing, continuing basis about our major construction projects. Uh, I think surprise was one of the elements that has caused such questions about the CIP as a whole and about some projects in particular. Uh, so we have a tool that we've used uh, for a long time that uh, tracks the projects in the CIP on a monthly basis with a minor amount of modification. I think it'll be good for you all to look at. Uh, to keep you engaged and involved in those CIP projects. Likewise, it uh, is a red flag for us when we've got a project that's beginning to, to creep towards that, that mark where it's over budget or some other consequence. Uh, so just as a matter of information here, we're, we're wanting to report that we did hear you and we will begin making those reports on a monthly basis. Jim, thank you for working on this. You know, we had our, our uh, workshop on Friday I, I don't think uh, I want to give the council credit that 
you know, I think everyone has made it absolutely clear on where we stand on construction projects and with voting on the audit uh, on, on making sure that we know where everything is, that um, the information that, that will be and should be brought to the council that we're kept up to date on those. So thank you all for, for working on that. We're, we're continuing to learn. As we all are. All right, we now have item B, authorize interim city manager to amend. We, we got one more. Okay. We got one more. All right. Uh, when you heard Jim Kerr make the presentation about the, the need to hire uh, through a service contract engineers, both for the, the engineering department and for his transportation department, you saw just a bit of the problem that staff has identified uh, in terms of our lack of competitiveness in certain areas for salaries. Um, department heads met now two weeks ago and began the process of examining why and how we can fix some of this lack of competitiveness. Um, what, what you saw tonight is a short-term solution uh, to what we hope we bring back as a comprehensive fix along with the budget document. But there's some other solutions that we think we need to have in our, our tool bag right now to facilitate actions as they are needed. Uh, this is not to say these will be common occurrences, but I can't tell you that they're gonna be only one of, that they're gonna be isolated in only one of, one of cases. That is to reestablish internal equity amongst employees when a new hire comes on board at a higher wage than folks who've been in the organization for periods of time uh, have, have earned. Uh, I used the case in point of, of the Water Resources Department and their need to hire an assistant plant manager at the water plant. Uh, that individual is well skilled. He's worked for us before. We know his capabilities both in leadership and his technical expertise. Uh, the salary with which we can attract him to work for the city places two of his uh, roughly comparable compatriots in the department at a real disadvantage monetarily. And so what we're asking council for is the ability for the manager to make recommendation on salaries to individuals who are currently employed to maintain that internal equity inside the departments. Uh, however you would like for us to bring those back for your review, whatever constraints that you would like to put on us on those types of actions, we're more than happy to comply with. I can tell you that, that I won't consider any of those where the department head has not had some sort of overall conceptual plan for where and how his salaries of employees relate amongst each other. We will not bring back a, a proposal that has major budget implications or that puts any departmental budgets in jeopardy. And again, these are short-term improvements until the full plan can be brought back to council at the budgets. Um, glad to make any, any adjustments that you all would like for us to see in here, but feel like the flexibility is required to get key people back into the employment of the city. What, what kind of parameters are, would be realistic? I, I'm not sure, you know, since we haven't done this before, what's a realistic parameter to require? Because there ought to be some oversight at some point, for, you know, that you would trigger uh, coming back to council to inform us. There ought to be something. What's happy, happy to bring these back to council as they occur. Um, we have one currently in front of us. I think there may be two more in the process. Uh, again, I don't think there's a great number of these that will be coming forward. They are, in some instances, one ofs, uh, but I think the flexibility, no different than we just spent money to, have to bring engineers on through service agreements because our pay plan is so inadequate. We're not competitive for those engineers in terms of their actual employment. Uh, I think we've, we've got to provide our department heads and the manager some flexibility to keep employees who are already with us, who have stayed in the employment of the city, who do the same or very comparable jobs, 
in a right relationship with new hires that we bring in at higher wages. Do we feel like, and, and I'm all for giving the department heads flexibility to be able to make these decisions, but do we feel like that, you know, one of the biggest complaints that we hear is internal equity and by giving that authority without having some kind of plan in place, do we feel like that we're going to create more internal equity issues by doing this? I think you could inside of a department. Uh, I, I don't think there are broad opportunities for these to bleed over from one department to another. But certainly I think any time you give existing employees salary increases inside that department, you have some of those risks where other employees, what, what people get paid is not a secret in our organization. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that would shock you, but there are no secrets in terms of pay in our organization. Uh, so I, I think there is the opportunity for some uh, potential conflict inside of a department, but because of the special nature of these positions, these are not uh, general labor, these are not uh, CDL drivers, these are technical people with specific expertise that, that come in uh, ones and twos in terms of a whole organization, not in tens and twenties. The thing we gotta be careful about if we're not consistent in how we do this, and, and really I think that's the key word for the council right now, if, if talking on Friday is stability, is, is getting stability within the organization as, as a whole. You know, if we have, and I'll use the CDL driver for example, you know, we've got CDL drivers that work for different departments all over the city. And we've gotta be really careful that whatever we do in one department with a CDL driver, that that's gonna have to be looked at what we're doing in this other department over here. Because, um, you know, we went through this I forget how many years ago it was, but we ended up having departments competing against departments where people were leaving different departments to go to another department. So I don't want us to get back in that, that situation where, you know, not only we're competing with the private sector, we're competing internally with, with, with that. So, you know, I'm not saying it doesn't need to be done, but we got to take those into consideration. This is not the broad fix uh, where we find ourselves uncompetitive uh, CDL drivers, um, other types of general labor uh, in various areas. Uh, this is primarily what we think works quickly to help out with technical people who have special skills and abilities that they bring to the organization. We do not see this as a broad fix for the issues that we've identified in the major parts of the workforce. Is there something that needs to happen? I mean, does it need to be so flexible that it happens whenever you, we want to do it? Do, that, that we adjust it at that point in time, or can we do it once a year, twice a year, uh, quarterly? Some, some kind of thing that has some kind of parameter? Uh, uh, I really think this is more of the opportunistic timing. Um, the, the case in front of us right now is an opportunity where uh, for a lot of reasons we have the opportunity to hire an employee with skills and abilities that we know and have tested. Uh, but we can't hire him inside the pay schedule that we currently operate from. So if we, uh, it's clear that we don't have to hire this individual. We could make do. We've made do without this position now for a number of months. But we've identified this as a key employee that we want to bring back into the organization. That's just the one ofs. I think the next one that comes before you is a one of. I think the third one that may come before you is a one of. These are not the broad fixes. Uh, the broad fixes have to come as we do our work to get ready for your next budget. Uh, but I think that immediate relief comes in certain areas by doing these one ofs with technical skilled positions, uh, no different than the one ofs that I hope we did tonight on hiring engineers via contract. So the hiring of engineers via contract is a very expensive way to provide that skill. And yet we are not competitive today to go out and recruit those positions. If it's okay, I, I, I kind of want to address this in a two pronged approach because I, I don't think after the retreat that us four need to decide for the group 
on, on whether or not this is going to continue to be an ongoing practice. However, I have talked with Darren this week, and I do think it's a very important in the particular case of the Water and Sewer Department that this position be filled. And so I'm going to go ahead and make the motion that we approve the uh, recommendation of the hire for the Water and Sewer Department. Uh, and I'll stop there. Okay. Okay, so you have a motion not on making adjustments. Uh, I'm happy to bring them back one at a time because I really fine. don't see more than about three in our future. Okay. This is on the water and sewer department only. Second. Motion is second. Ms. Wright, recall the roll. Mr. Shacklett. Aye. Mr. Smotherman. Aye. Mr. Wade. Aye. Mayor McFarland. Aye. Is there any more discussion on now that we've got that? And, on? and now that we've taken care of the water and sewer, I, I think that it would be advantageous for us to either, I think the best thing for us to do tonight would be to defer uh, any comment on item B as a general uh, condition because I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's probably something that we need all council members involved in the conversation point of clarification on your motion was that to to hire the individual and do the internal equity moves of the two others yes thank you and that that's fine I, I really do see these as one ofs in a way uh, we'll bring them back as as needed you know the one thing I, I just make a comment and this is not directed to Mr. Crumley at all you know, I, I've made this comment. I spoke to a group yesterday, and, and I said after our uh, workshop that we had last Friday, I'm honestly feeling a better spot of the direction that we're headed as a city and hearing from the department heads than I felt in a long time. Now, with that, then the excitement that's coming through, I think we have to be realistic. And, again, this is nothing to Mr. Crumley, but there's going to be someone else that's going to be sitting in that seat uh, as we're going through this city manager process and we have to make sure that we're not running to change everything as quick as we possibly can where we see that there's things that need to be fixed because we've got you know we are in the middle of another process so um, I just say that that I think we need to be able to identify where these issues are and we need to fix those but again we need to get stability where we are right now get some of these things leveled off and then find good ways to tackle it and move forward there because you know we may make some changes right now that we think is the, the best changes in the world but when the new person comes in they may look at that and say what were y'all thinking this doesn't work yeah. so uh, just and that's again and uh, i would be remiss if i didn't thank you all for the time and effort you put in at the retreat last week i can tell you how much department heads appreciated it and enjoyed it that's great we're not done with them yet yeah not i'm done with them yet <laughs> it, it was really good to hear from everyone all right, um, you've got board and commit, Mr. Crumley, thank you very much. Thank you. um, you've got the airport commission. Uh, I'm recommending reappointment of Mr. Steve Waldron and appointment of Ms. Gail Slotke. We'll make the comment again. We had several different people who have wanted to serve on this airport commission, but with the recommendation of the uh, general manager of the airport, uh, these are the two recommendations we're bringing forward. Move for approval. Second. second. Motion and second. Ms. Wright. Mr. Shacklett. Aye. Mr. Smotherman. <coughs> Aye. Mr. Way. Aye. Mayor McFarland. Aye. All right. Um, any beer permits? Yes, we, I have two items. Uh, I'm going to start with the regular beer permits first, and then I have another item to follow. Uh, we have a special event application from the Middle Tennessee Museum of Natural History. They have four different events they have planned already for 2018. All of these events are on their site and they meet our uh, requirements for the application to be approved. We also have a special event application for the Discovery Center. Two of the events are on their site. One is at a private residence in Georgetown. Uh, I'm assuming they'll go through Mr. Balachandran for a special event application for that location when the time comes. Otherwise, that application meets our requirements for approval. We have an ownership change for a restaurant at 301 Northwest Broad Street. They are asking for an on-premise application, I'm, I'm sorry, an on-premise permit for beer. 
they have met our background requirements, but they do need to finish up their uh, building codes inspection. So if you prove that tonight, we'll issue this permit once they have finished those uh, inspections. We also have an ownership change for a restaurant at 505 Case and Lane, Suite E. The background check meets our requirements. They also need to finish up their building codes inspection. So if you approve that tonight, we would issue that permit once they get their approvals. We have a catering permit for the new party foul at 127 Southeast Broad Street. Uh, they want to be able to uh, cater beer off their location. The background meets our requirements. Everything else in the application is in order, so we could issue that permit if you approve it tonight. Finally, we have uh, a market for a new location on 610 Old Bridge Avenue. That application is in order except for the uh, building codes inspections that they've not had beer in that location in the past. That's why it's listed as a new location. I'll be glad to try to answer any questions for you. Any questions? So moved. Right. So we have a motion. We need a second. Second. Motion and second. Mr. Shacklett? Aye. Mr. Smotherman? Aye. Mr. Wade? Aye. Mayor McFarland? Aye. Uh, Part B, I have laid a list of noncompliance complaints in front of you. I also emailed these to all council yesterday. Um, these locations have had my uh, sale of minors some up to three times and we are requesting to either have you hear these cases or to send them to our hearing officer which we put into place a couple of years ago and that's what you have voted to do in the past but each time we have these we bring them to you because in the ordinance it states you have 14 days to make a decision before it defaults to go to the hearing officer so we thought we would go ahead and get these in the mail tomorrow and ask you tonight if anyone is interested in having the uh, hearings go to you directly as opposed to the hearing officer who is appointed. Move we send them to the appointed hearing officer. Second. Motion second. Ms. Wright, we call the roll. Mr. Shacklett. Aye. Mr. Smotherman. Aye. Mr. Wade. Aye. Mayor McFarland. Aye. Any statements to be paid? Not tonight. Thank you. Nope. Any other business from the staff, from the city council? I have one quick comment. Um, we have had uh, some break-ins at some of our trailheads on our people breaking into cars. You know, I like to think we have lots of good people in Murfreesboro, um, but we have some that are waiting for you to leave things in your car. So we initiated uh, last year, our uh, Park Smart promo promotion. So, if you're parking at a Greenway Trailhead, please do your best not to leave items that are visible in your cars for those who don't have good intentions. Uh, with that, we're now working on installing security cameras throughout our park system, uh, prioritizing Greenway Trailheads. Uh, we've got increased patrols, and we're actually cur uh, currently hiring another uh, police officer that will be designated to uh, our park system and we're doing crime data analysis to better predict the patterns of some of the things that are that are happening so we're going to do everything that we possibly can to make sure that we're able to monitor and there are things that the police are doing that um, that they're continuing to work on but please make sure and, and do your part if you're parking at any of our park systems don't leave your purse your car door unlocked those things uh, in visible sight all right, if there's no other business, we will stand adjourned.